I'm delighted to have with me today Dennis Markey. Dennis, did I get the last name right? You He's, did okay. indeed. Hey, Markey, I'm, get, yes. I'm getting better. Getting and the good. good news is we both have Italian heritage. We do. So there's a lot. Our DNA's got a lot in common. There okay? you go. Well, first of all, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Dennis, along with about 15 to 20 other veterans, shows up every Monday at the Centerville Dunkin' Donuts, where we have something called the Veterans Coffee House. Very relaxed. No membership. No money involved. Just veterans talking to a lot veterans. Of fun. It's a lot of fun. A lot, of, a fun. lot of fun. Okay. Well, Dennis, let's start off like I normally do. Where did you grow up? I was born in Winchester, Virginia. Okay. But my parents lived in Front Royal, 20 oh, miles oh, away. Sorry, no, I, I used to coach at Radford University in Southwest Virginia. Oh, did you? My, yes. my daughter went to Radford. Oh, okay. But anyway, they, they were from Front but we had no hospital. Right. Okay. A couple of doctors. So they drove to, Front, to Winchester. Uh, I was born there. On the first day of January, 1940. 1940. And of okay. course, we moved back to our home there in Front Royal. We okay. grew up there. Uh, and it went to schools in Front Royal? Well, uh, being this as we're talking about the military, sure. I wore a uniform for 30 years. You're kidding me. You went to military school? Because uh, I went to Randolph Macon Military Academy, which is in Front no, it Royal. Well, yes. I was a day student. Okay. And uh, uh, most kids lived there. And then I went to Virginia Tech, which at the time was called Virginia Polytechnic Institute. And it was a military it, it was oriented, right? It was virtually all military. Yes, there, yes. Was some, there were obviously day students. There were students that were civilians. But, okay. Uh, and uh, that's how I was, uh, uh, and then came in the Army. So for 30 years, from 54 <laughs> to 84. Born, were you born in a uniform? I Dennis. was born in a uniform. <laughs> Dennis, what did you major in in Blacksburg or Virginia Tech? Well, I was in uh, industrial arts and okay. in architecture. Oh, very good. Okay. And uh, I was commissioned in 62 uh, after I'd finished four years, but I then taught school. I had to do some student teaching. You were doing industrial ed? No, I was oh, no. teaching uh, engineering drawing. Oh, engineering drawing. Okay, mechanical drawing. Mechanical drawing sure. uh, in Fairfax, Virginia. No, Northern Virginia. Northern Virginia. It's right and across then, the river from me. I was Walt Whitman High School in Montgomery County. Okay. I, yeah, right across the river. I can't think of the name of the school, quite frankly, okay. in Fairfax. But anyway, no and then in June of that year, 63, is when I went to infantry school at Fort Benning. Okay, now let me back up a little bit. Yeah. You go four years tech. Four years tech. Taught a little bit. Taught a little bit. Now, are you commissioned upon graduation, or you how are. does that work? Okay, I, so. I was commissioned, yes, upon uh, at the end of their uh, four years, uh, commissioning ceremony, of course, and uh, we were commissioned, and uh, uh, we knew that we had, a, I think, a three-year obligation upon right. graduation. Uh, graduation, and uh, uh, that's what I did. That's how I got in the army okay, because so I you was in the Lieutenant army ROTC. Commission. What branch of the army, or what field? Well. It's interesting. Uh, we could go on. <laughs> only, only the army can mess this up. I know that. At, at the time that I was commissioned, they did not have a military intelligence branch. MI, right? MI. Okay. okay. They were begin. It was the, in the beginning of the development of the branch, All so right. we had nowhere to go. We didn't have a Fort Bliss or a Fort Benning or a Fort Hollowberg Meade or whatever. Yeah. It, yeah. Uh, so uh, they sent us all all MI to the. Infantry school. You went to an infantry and school. And went through the infantry school, got a, a 1546 MOS, okay. small unit leader. All right. uh, from there, I then went to Fort Holliburton, Maryland. Right here in Baltimore. Which is no longer exists. It's an industrial park. Dennis, I think. that's where I took the oath to go in the Army in 1966. Oh, Fort Holliburton? Yes, sir. Well, you know what it was. It yes. was a couple buildings yes. and then, you know, much, a couple much. streets. It wasn't much to it. Uh, so, uh, and then from there, uh, a bunch of us were standing about. What do we do now? We had to, we, you know, go to another assignment. Right. We said, let's go to language school. Okay. They sent you out to California. So we went out to DLIWC, Defense Language Institute, West Coast. Okay. And we all studied German. Now, was that Monterey? That was in Monterey. Right, right. Now, we figured that they were going to send us to Italy. Of course Or not. to Spain. Or you Santa. probably went to Japan. We, <laughs> Japan, because we spoke German. Uh, but fortunately, we all got assigned to Germany. Oh, you did get the posting yes. there. So we went tech, got commissioned, taught a little bit, went through some training as infantry, but you knew you were going to be MI, yes. and then sent to Germany. Yes. Am I going to get that right? I got, went to Germany directly 
from the uh, language school. From language school. Now, what, what was uh, a young second lieutenant uh, military intelligence in the uh, 60s? What was that like? Well, I was in counterintelligence. Counterintelligence. And because okay. I had a basic command of the German language, I worked with three Germans oh, yeah, on doing were. counterintelligence okay. operations. Okay. Uh, at that point, there was a very heated Cold War. Yes. There was Germany divided in two parts. We won't go into the specifics, yeah. but there was a Cold War going on, Absolutely. which was very heated. Yep. Now, were you there during the Berlin Wall building and all that? Uh, no, I think that was before that. That was before that. Yeah, okay. that was That's before when Kennedy that. first got elected. Yeah, okay. That, that, uh, I don't know the date offhand. I got there in, well, I got there in 64. So that would have been, LBJ was president then, yeah, so you yes, would have been. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, and then served to 67. But uh, let me interject please, one thing yeah, because of what's going on now in Israel. Mm -hmm. One night in June, I had received my orders to Vietnam in May of 67. Okay. Uh, of of uh, uh, 67. While well, you're in Germany. While well, I'm in Germany. Just about all of it, my other officer buddies had already gone. And I was, I'm going to miss this. My turn. Know, yeah. I, I got to get out of here. So I finally got the orders. When I had the orders in May, in June, the Six Day War in Israel broke out. Oh, Lord. And I was called out of the movie. The movie stopped. I was called out of the movie. And with my wife, I took her wife home. I said, get to your office, all intelligence personnel, immediately. Had to report. Well, okay. I was the commander of the intelligence, counterintelligence unit. Oh, the there whole in, unit. In the, in now, the, were you uh, first lieutenant or captain? Or I, was a, uh, I was a captain. Oh, you were then, captain at yeah, that point. Yeah. Okay. Um, I told my guys what we needed to do. We needed to get dressed in battle uniform and be in front of the office tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock. We're going to Israel. For real? You went to Israel? No, I didn't oh, say that. Yeah, okay, okay. Go ahead. I didn't say that. This now, is listen. the Army. I got to remember. Okay. Yeah, I got to listen. So I got them up there. I said, 9 o'clock that night, we got to get ready. We went home. You know, we got uh, 7 o'clock the next morning, we're there. I asked my commander, Colonel, I said, what, am I, what is my mission? <laughs> you got to have a mission. Sure. What am I going to do there? I don't know. <laughs> you were in the uncle, uh, Army Uncle Sam. Yeah, you know, okay. <laughs> so anyway, the next morning, the war ended that night. Oh, okay. So it was a six-day war. Exactly. So they called everything off. Okay. So you and got a break. Did. You didn't. So let's let's go. We then. Uh, uh, my wife was put as she did every time. Uh, did a great job. Uh, uh, got everything together and we left. Uh, I had to be in Vietnam in July. Mm. Now this is mid June or so. So you're talking a couple weeks. You've I, got I to had to move Vietnam. out. So we got home and uh, uh, and I, I'd like to let, before we talk about Vietnam, let me tell you sure, how I sure. got there of course. and what happened because it's kind of interesting. I made I spent two tours in Vietnam: 67, 68, 70, 71. Okay. I came uh, I had a little break there between the two tours. Now. Uh, my family said goodbye at Dulles Airport. I flew to Chicago. Right. We flew to Anchorage. Okay. We flew to uh, Tokyo or somewhere Japan. in that somewhere area. Somewhere in Japan, right. Somewhere in Japan. Then we flew to Benoit Air Base in Vietnam. Oh, okay. Another way I went was to California from Travis Air Force Base, right. which is a huge Air Force Base uh, up from San Francisco, to Hawaii. To Clark so Air Base. You went Base. two different routes on two, two different, different route, tours. Two different tours. I had actually came back three times, but hmm. nevertheless, anyway. uh, from then to uh, Clark Air Base in the Philippines. Now Clark was a very famous air base because lined up as far as you could see were B-52s. Okay. Because the B-52s took right? off okay. from Clark from the Philippines. to to do their bombing run, runs over Hanoi and the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Correct. Correct. Which ran, as you know, down through Cambodia mm -hmm. and Laos mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, then we got into uh, one of the flights, and it could have been the one out of Travis. We flew on a DC-8. Is that the smaller plane? No, that's, no, no. that's let me tell you a minute. Go ahead. That was, it went off, we got on a DC-8. Now, it's a four-engine, you would call it a comer commercial airline. Okay. But what they had did, and I don't know the mechanics of this, they cut it in half. And they added 10, 20, 30 feet or so to, <laughs> to it <the> plane. <laughs> to connect the tail to the rest right. of the plane so they could get more seats. 
So now we had upwards of 300 soldiers, soldiers on this plane. Going to Vietnam. We had seven, we called them stewardesses at that time, uh, flight attendants. We had 17 flight attendants mm. on the aircraft. They were busy people. They were, they were busy. They mm. were delightful ladies. Good. They really were. Good. Uh, and they flew, then we flew into, uh, eventually we got into uh, uh, the air base. Tonsonuke uh, or whatever uh, no, no. We never flew into Tonsonuke. We flew into... Uh, Long Vin? Long, uh, no. Uh, yeah. Doesn't matter, that's right. You, uh, you land uh, in Vietnam. I landed in Vietnam. Uh, Benoit. Benoit. And before those 900, uh, uh, 300 of us got off the airplane, they had folks pulling baggage out of the hold. Mm. And the baggage was stuffed, just laid out on the tarmac. You just, had to grab it. Just, yes. just, just uh, you know, all right, boys, get your baggage. <laughs> There's 300 duffel to, bags. 300 bags. <laughs> over, get over here to the uh, main building, and we got some words for you. It was late in the day, at 5.30 or exhausting I don't know what it was. Flight. Yeah, exhausting flight. Exhausting flight. And they said, we have to get you to Long Bend, which was 30-minute drive. There's about six buses there. Mm -hmm. said, don't worry, we're going to have an armed escort. There was one Jeep, had a 30 caliber machine gun in the back, and a driver. Okay. That that's, was our, escort. that's our escort. <laughs> we had to drive through the jungle, mm. and they reminded us that if you go through the jungle at night anywhere, there's going to be an ambush. There's going to be trouble. There's going to be trouble. Yes. We had no way. We had nothing. Our duffel bag. Welcome but to we, Vietnam. Welcome to Vietnam. So what we got there? Uh, when we got to the 90, I think it was the 90, uh, I forget the name of the number of the, of the replacement depot. They said, you know, get something to eat here and, and get find a rack in the tents and gather here in the morning. 300 of us. They had a huge bullet bulletin board on which they put our names. Where are you going to go? And yeah, yeah, where are you going to go? Where you report? What time? And all that sort of thing. Well, they had 299 names up there. They didn't, <laughs> have, didn't have mine. <laughs> Your name wasn't on the oh, list. No, no, it wasn't up there. <laughs> that was the first day. Strike one. Second day. Nothing. No marquee. Mm. Well, I can't, what am I going to do, spend my entire and life here at this at the holding base, tent? Yeah. The third day, I was the only one there. You Everybody else is going, oh, i gotta, I got to mention. The first question they ask us when we got there, that, that next morning. And you're a captain. You're a captain. Uh, no, uh, a I'm a captain. captain. I'm a captain. captain. Who has a will? <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks. Nobody has a will. No, we're kids. No hands went we're up. We're kids. We're kids. We, yeah. we don't. We don't even think about wills. No, no. So they had a piece of paper, a generic will. Or? Yeah, a generic will. You put. You want to leave ABC, You want to leave your possessions to your wife. We wrote that in. You signed it. Couple of witnesses gave it back to them. You have a will. <laughs> <laughs> now, only it, the army. I don't do know if it was ever notarized. They may have notarized all three hundred <laughs> of them at the same time. Stop! Stop! That's stop. right. So we we got a will then, and uh, so it's the third day. I'm standing there. Uh, a jeep pulls up. Got two guys in it, and then we're looking for Captain Markey. I'm the only <laughs> one standing. There. I said, "Well, that happens to be me." He said, "Throw your bags in here and go." I said, "Where are we going?" He says, "You've been assigned to the." 12th Combat Aviation Group. Aviation? You're Aviation military Aviation intelligence. Group. I'm military. I said, well, you got the wrong guy. Yeah. I, I've never been in a Huey. <laughs> I don't want to be in a I Huey. Don't like, I like the ground. <laughs> I'm a ground pounder. Get, get in the back of the Jeep. Be quiet, Captain. Be quiet, yeah. Captain. Now, these were two enlisted two, guys? Two, yeah, yeah, a couple of you know, sergeants and corporals, yeah, yeah. whatever. I don't remember. Uh, so, uh, fortunately, we were at Long. The, the, we were we were on the post of Long, Long Bend, Bend yeah. which is a huge, huge place, post. Yes. Army I was there too. I, uh, you, we every, all went I'm through sure it. we all went through it. Um, and then the headquarters of the 12th happened to be at the other end of Long Bend. So we had a mile or so to oh, really a huge drive. post. Yes, yes. And there was fencing all along. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the road was reasonably paved, and then there was an interior road. It was dirt and gravel and so forth. Anyway, we got there. They threw me out of the Jeep, said, there's the colonel's office. I went in and our support reported in. And he said, yeah, we're glad to have you. I figured we needed someone to run the S2 shop. Oh, and so you, did, you were was, running S2 uh, intelligence. Yes, for, I was running uh, S2 is intelligence, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, now there was a the S2 was usually a major or colonel who right. was flight qualified waiting to get a job as a pilot. Oh, OK. A, uh, you know, battalion commander. So they gave or, him the S2 uh, spot to keep but, him So busy, I yeah. kind of ran the, the intelligence end of the S2 sure. shop because they, they had no, in, no 
education and intelligence and didn't care about it. <laughs> it meant nothing to them. Uh, you can say that. I, can, I was in S2 and play coup. Oh, were you? My morning, every morning, just the, I had to brief a major, one or two captains and some young Louis. Yeah. What the overnight, what you were probably sending us uh, was going on. Yeah. And I used to sit there. Here I was at E4 and these guys were drinking coffee. Hey, man. Well, I, I briefed the colonel and his, okay, and his entire staff, the, okay. the, the executive and all the other staff members uh, mm -hmm. about, I had a huge map on my wall of, of our area of operations, right. our AO. I had an order of battle up there when I could find out where these folks were. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, I, I went over there uh, and met who was the S2 at the time, who was an infantry lieutenant colonel. And he was there for one reason, to be a commander of an aviation battalion. He was just waiting. He was, he was just waiting, waiting to be the, to, for one of the other commanders sure. to leave. We were a very large unit. We had six aviation battalions. Mm. Well, if you had long been, you had to have been big, right? We were huge. I mean, yes. And they weren't all there. They were spread all throughout. All over the country. Oh, yeah. All over the country. All over the, our area of operations. Oh, your area. Okay. Yeah, because we had, the 1st Aviation Brigade had two uh, groups the 12th and I think the 1st. We okay. were the 12th. The 1st was further up north. But this is major operation. These yeah, people major, are under, yeah. 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 Our yeah. unit, our, our, our commander was a colonel. Okay. Now, full bird. It, full bird. Full bird. Now, uh, uh, an army division would probably run over there uh, 14,000 men. We're talking say. about a lot of, a lot 14 of troops. 14 to 16, depending troops. on their mission and where they were. Right. We were as big as an army division. Oh, man. Now, an army division is commanded by a two-star. We were commanded by a full colonel. Full colonel. So he, he had a villa. Uh, he had all, his own villa? He had his own villa. Okay. Now, it was interesting, the setup. All of our enlisted personnel, and it, uh, as far as I can remember, I never saw a woman in uniform over there. Not they're, they're either that I, when I was in. I, I, I don't think there was any there. No. They may have been. I Do, don't know. Donut dollies. That was. We it. saw the donut yeah. dollies, and that was nice to see a young lady with some donuts and a yes. cup of coffee. But anyway, uh, all of the officers of our headquarters lived in Benoit, okay. where he had his villa. We had a road that was that was cordoned right to, off, right to the place, and all the officers lived in a stone two-story. Uh, billet, if you will, yeah. and then he had his uh, fairly decent accommodation. Very, very yeah. decent accommodation. So all the officers at the end of the day would have to drive over there, mm. but all the enlisted stayed here. But after you know two or three months, he thought, well, I think maybe we better have a couple officers over there. Yes, who was case. selected, of course. Oh, welcome the to non-rated pilots <laughs> and, the, and the headquarters company commander, another captain. Oh, really? But they gave him when he first got there. A like a fifty or fifty-five foot trailer. Oh, he lived in the trailer. He lived that. He never lived in it. Oh, okay. That's what they. That's what he was rate, he rated to have. Oh, okay. I mean, it had a kitchen and a living room, nice, a bathroom, yes. two bedrooms. Yes. Very nice. Nice facility. Air conditioned. Mm. That's he said. Hey, you can live in my trailer. Well, we let you. Thank you, Colonel. That's a good deal. That. Thank you, sir. Yeah, we'll <laughs> we'll take it. So uh, we moved in. So, so that we had some officers there with the troops. And uh, which was fortunate because, as you well know, probably the most significant battle of the war was Tet 68. Sure. You and were I might a tell the viewers if, if you haven't read or don't know about Tet 68, you should look into that particular, if you have any interest in Vietnam at all. It might have rewritten it, the it, war it, it, in many it ways. It did because it was a significant military victory right. for us. But the U.S. press at that time, with the all of the uh, unrest and uh, not riots, the county but, war uh, demonstrations, yeah, the demonstrations and so forth, we got killed by the press. We got killed, killed by, by the, the press, press, and that really began the the downward swath. Uh, we lost Walter Cronkite, I think, during Tet. I don't know how you feel about it. But well, I don't. Uh, yeah, Walter was a great guy, I guess, but I, 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 we probably did. And once that happened, the media started. It, it was yeah. it was over. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh. So uh, I, I happened to be the duty. I was only two officers there, myself and Brownlee. Uh, it was a it was a harrowing uh, two days. Probably, I mean, uh, you're fighting for your survival, uh, correct? The rockets coming in. Right. Uh, I counted forty three of them as I was hugging rockets. my the floor of the of the room. Um, 
uh, after the thing was over, the next morning, we did get a helicopter up. They, you see, they wanted our location. It was about 200 across the street. They wanted our location because we had helicopters. Okay. And they hated the helicopters. Well, that was our best, I don't know how you feel, that was the best type of war we were fighting, is the helicopter Hel supported and directed. Yeah, I mean, they, without helicopters, that you, you, you couldn't, had no chance. you had no chance no to chance. go anywhere. No. I mean, you was, oh, so they wanted to go after that aviation. They unit, wanted those, the helicopter, so they figured they were. Uh, and all that we had between us and and them was a barbed wire fence. Chain fence, yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, we, uh, I was a duty officer, so I went around. I was inspecting. We had two uh, thirty caliber machine gun positions. One up front at where the road across the road was a large, almost football size, and then beyond that was what was called the. Widow's Village, and that village was where the widows of the Arvin, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, oh, they, they lived where it. they lived when oh, they lost wow. their husband. Oh, wow. They put them in this village, and the Viet Cong and NVA infiltrated that during the day. It was down in a little gully, mm. couldn't see them, and then they were to come across that football field, across our fence, and then into to our area, and all we had was our was we weren't infantry uh, uh, soldiers. No, we were. You're we were headquarters. Well, yes. we were headquarters. Okay. Uh, personnel administration, right. that sort of thing. Right. So uh, it's interesting. Uh, as I was doing my rounds, checking the machine gun, we only had two. We had one in the back because there was a no man's land back there, which was also fenced off. So we figured if they got in there, we were in reasonable we're in, trouble we're because in trouble. we didn't have any men. Everybody was up no front. No support whatsoever there. No yeah. support. There was yeah. no infantry. Nothing. Mm. Fortunately, we had a backhoe come in and dig us a ditch, oh, ditch. where we could get down and get the troops down in a yeah. ditch. Okay. And that was connected to the uh, machine gun position. And then we had a ready reaction force that was uh, in a uh, sandbag bunker of maybe mm. 10 men. That was about mm. it. But I went out on and looked because we had four claymore mines attached to the to the uh, fence okay now people don't know what a claymore yeah, mine is don't. but it's it's a mine that's kind of shaped in a convex or concave mm -hmm. however mm -hmm. you want to look at it if you pick it up and look at it you'd think that this top up part up this rounded part would be the thing that would face the enemy because you'd spray out you know uh, ball bearings whatever, whatever sure. in all directions well, correct but it was this side it was okay. the underside that was to be pointed out. Well, they were all backwards. Oh, <laughs> aimed at you. <laughs> they were aimed right at us. Oh, Lord. And the reason I, can, I knew that hmm. was because if you looked at one and you looked at the back side, it said on there, Fred, Danger. this side toward the enemy. <laughs> and the engineer didn't American read it. Troops. They didn't read that. This side toward the enemy. That's why I turned them all around. Mm. Thank goodness I went out there. Otherwise, you would have killed more men. We would have shot ourselves with these things, and they were mm. very lethal. Mm. I mean, they had, I don't know how many ball bearings, you know, in there, sure, and sure. whatever else. Just spewed these uh, spewed, in a direction them out everywhere. Sure. Yeah, so if you have a charging enemy, let it go. You're going to get a few of those. Right. Uh, right. Plus, we had a machine. Anyway, uh, we got that squared away. Uh, that night. Now, remind everybody how long, I mean, is this 24 hours, 48 hours, couple, what's that was the, that was the, that day. One day. We're talking about 24 hours of total terror, correct? Uh, no. No. How no. Long? Oh. no, it was the day of the attack. Well, okay. it, it was that we were setting this up also. One other thing I want to mention, sure. we had, there was a signal lieutenant who, down in this hole with, uh, it must have been 150 wires <laughs> that connected all to of all the, the phones in the mm. whole area. <laughs> it was cut one by guy. the boulder. One lieutenant. I walked over. I said, Lieutenant, <laughs> You're in trouble. can I help you? Is it? No, he said, no, I got to Let me get one wire hooked up so you can talk to someone. One unit. One, one unit. unit. There, he, he knew he wasn't going to get all 100 mm. of them. Mm. Pairs were everywhere. Got them hooked up. Uh, this was the day bef we knew that there was the, the, the attacks were going on at Tet 68, if you recall, the entire country. All over the country. The whole Correct. country was Correct. attacked. Saigon, your the, long been. Yes. The, the U.S. Embassy was breached, Correct. the wall. Correct. And, and, and there, were, there were fatalities, of course, not nearly as many as the enemy. Uh, so that we were getting prepared because we figured that we were going to be involved we're, we're, in this yeah, thing sure. at some point. Sure. The next morning, I did my rounds about 2.30. Mm -hmm. Checked my boys in the front, ones in the back, you know, and 
And uh, my office happened to be, I didn't know it at the time, was being used as the uh, medical facility. See, we had a flight surgeon. Okay. Uh, and he was, if he said you couldn't fly, you couldn't you fly. You were grounded. You were grounded. grounded. That, that, he was the final word. And he had a medic with him, of course, in his office. It may have been a couple, I don't know. Uh, and uh, we were just doing all this. So about 2.30 that night, the, ne the next morning, I made the same rounds, checking everything to see if everybody's, everybody's awake, doing ready for all right. this, and that sort of thing. Got in uh, back in the headquarters building, which was I was a duty officer, if you will. There was there was just two of us there, um, <clears throat> and I said, guys, I'm going to go in the colonel's office. We had put up a cot, army cot. You mm -hmm. didn't need a blanket. Um, and I, I say at three o'clock, I climbed there and I was kind of not asleep, but thinking about things. Three twenty. I looked at my watch. Three twenty. The first. 122 millimeter Soviet rocket. It started. They're about what six, uh, six to eight inches mm -hmm. in diameter, mm -hmm. and about five feet long. Hit right outside the back of my window. Mm -hmm. And you could hear the stuff against the walls. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, there was a tent there with two men in it. Mm -hmm. He got hit. Of course, killed both of them. Mm -hmm. He got hit. So all of a sudden, there was another one and another one and another one. So I started yeah, counting. Mm -hmm. Four, five, seven, nine, thirteen, twenty-five, twenty-six, thirty-eight, forty, forty-one, forty-two, forty-three. Silence. This is a major attack. Major attack. Major forty-three attack. rounds came this in. This is war. This, this is, is war. war. And I just, I, I just, I, I couldn't. There was nowhere to go. There, we didn't have foxholes, bunkers, or anything. I just remained there on the Cross floor. Cross your fingers. Cross Cross, your fingers. I was counting these things. Oh, Lord. I, I wasn't thinking, but how many more are there going to be? So I continued to count, and 43 gets stopped. Dead silence. Mm -hmm. I waited a little bit, uh, not long. I got up, went in to check on my two guys, two other guys with me uh, in the other, other room, and they were fine. And uh, within 10 minutes, all hell, excuse me, broke loose. Broke Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching QAC TV 7, and thank you for watching, thank you for your service. Dennis has told us just the beginning. Just the beginning. Uh, part one of what went on in Vietnam. We'll get him back. So I'm Fred McNeil on behalf of Dennis. Our time is up. Thank you for your time. We're going to see you next time, and I'd like to salute all the veterans in the audience. Also, thank you. Mm -hmm.